You went a little fast there. You got, uh, you got, you got one Mississippi. Of, you got ahead of yourself. I did. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Pondering the Pages with Kyle and Pierce. Hey. So I was just asking Pierce, and he had a pretty good day yesterday. And he said, yeah, it's a pretty good day. What happened? What happened to me? Yeah. <laughs> I came up here. Uh, Let's see. So we, oh, well, this is going to lead into uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, but. Technology. So we got a new camera. It's that one over there, which makes it a bittersweet day. It's sweet because we got a new camera, but it's bitter because we're retiring this little guy. So. Elijah? No. Doesn't have an old faithful is probably what I, I just dubbed that name this morning. So I got this camera in. 2016 yeah, around may or june um because it, ted lotus gave me a piece of advice he said invest in a invest in a decent camera to take with you on your travels so i got that it was an entry level nikon at the time it was like 500 bucks so i got it and then i got this lens pretty short after that the nifty 50 and that pair was with me for seven years and documented prop it probably took I was trying to do the math the other day. It was probably over 20,000, 25,000 photos total. And you've taken some pretty good photos. I mean, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, Pierce is an amateur photographer on the side. Ho- hobbyist, yeah. Amateur. Hmm. Hobbyist, I guess. But it's... Uh, so, in honor of, of this little guy, I <laughs> made a list of my top ti- top five photos that I ever took with this. Will you show them on the podcast? I will. I'm going to show them to you now, and then I'll, and I got the list narrowed down to 14. So my, this is my list of top five. You know, being honest with you, it's just like photos. a lot of times I listen to it on Spotify most of the time. Yeah. Just to go back and listen to it and see what kind of blunders I make. Mm-hmm. But watching it on YouTube, I didn't know the work that you're putting into this. Mm-hmm. Like, you put stuff in there. Like, if you ever go to YouTube and watch it, it's just like... Like the people you talk about, you put pictures of them. Like, Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it's just like so. It's just like it's kind of cool. It gives you a little bit of a, you can see how good looking of a guy this is. That's right. That's right. So here, uh, where is it? Top five photos with the D thirty three hundred. So let me turn my brightness up and get, make it to where you can rotate it. How did you judge? Uh, part of it was nostalgia, and part of it was just um, like objectively how good of a photo this is, is it? beautiful yeah so this was the first photo i ever took with this camera oh it's your papa that is that's my papa i can hear him say praise jehovah <laughs> so i took it out of the box and that's cool took it out of the box and put through the lens on there and and walked into the kitchen and he was coming out of the bedroom and because i was living with him at the time man i can see <clears throat> cindy right there yeah yeah he I think she looks like him. This was the second photo I ever took. I just turned, literally turned Look around, and she was standing right there. Grandma. Mm-hmm. What an awesome, that's an awesome pair of people. So this is, this. I think this is the best photo I ever took. It's kind of a cool way that I got it. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. That catches it, doesn't it? So I, I uh, was, when I was walking through, I was trying to get pictures, and that little girl was coming up behind me and was looking at something to somebody else over there and i literally just held the camera down by my side down by my leg and tried to point it up at her and and just hit focus autofocus and snapped it and that was what i got so with what's behind her obviously it looks like the canopy of trees and yep. stuff like that now with the way that looks would that be aperture or would that be bokeh aperture is the the ring that's inside the lens that opens and closes based on okay Bokeh is the effect. Is okay, the blur so effect. the so blur that, effect is the bokeh. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, aperture is the the actual setting on the camera. Okay, I had those. Uh, not a hobbyist. So this one, this, this is number four. This was my. Uh, we got fourteen though. So this. Oh, okay. This was my first kind of experimenting with long exposures over one second. That was a motorcycle I drove in Guatemala. Is that the one you wrecked? Yeah. Oh man! Yeah, For a buddy from church is still driving it, as far as I know. Dude, that's a sweet bike. I put the green lights over the motor. How much that bike cost over there? That was, I think it was twelve hundred dollars, brand new. I mean, when you rode through the streets of Guatemala on that thing, were they like, "There goes Gringo"? 
No, I was I, I was wore a full face helmet and it I had a, a a dark visor on it so you couldn't see my face at all. Okay, were you a lot could, of people riding could, a bike like that? You though? could see my beard sticking out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that was I'd say it was about fifty fifty cars and motorcycles. What is that? Two fifty? What is that? One twenty five. Is it really? Yeah, I would love to have that, that bike. That thing going going on a straightaway, maybe a slight downhill, which would help you. I mean, flattened out like 50 miles an hour you really <laughs> yeah yeah we and it's that is yeah, awesome maxed out jackson wants a motorcycle yeah a this bike. one uh this is a good portrait one of my favorite portraits this is marvin from costa rica i remember you telling me about this guy yeah i've told you that story man that guy that guy's got the look mm -hmm. there's just something about him that was he pretty cool yeah i'd hang out with him i hung out with him that was my second trip hanging out with him and uh so i Brought my camera, and I was like, hey, Marvin, you mind if I get a picture of you? I like to take pictures of the people that are in my life. Can I get a picture of you? And he goes, yeah, sure. And so I got a few of them. Did you ever ponder the pages? A little bit, yeah. He uh, he had some Bible knowledge? He had been on the streets for a really long time, so he kind of had that. You know, when you meet, talk to somebody that's been on the streets for a really long time, and it seems like they've gathered views from many different spiritual walks and religions yeah, and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. They kind of put them in a, mi in a mixing pot. This one is uh, uh, Chino and Danny. They were fighting, and I thought that was a really good picture. <laughs> that is an awesome picture. Which one's Danny? Danny's the short one on, over here. He's got Chino up against the <laughs> yeah. wall by his armpits. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but uh, which one's Danny? This one. Chino's just kind of smiling at him, laughing at him though. So it's yeah. just like, I don't think they're really, really mad. No, they were they were play fighting. Danny, Some cute kids. Danny always took it a little more personal. This was a. I just thought this was a really good one. She was she was always happy to get her picture taken. Yolanda. Boy, she got beautiful eyes, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. It's like that movie Sound of Freedom. I cannot. That I just feel like it's a different level of evil when you abuse kids. Yeah. I just. Uh, I mean, that's one thing to where it's just like. Ooh, I feel like some righteous indignation would come out if I come upon that. Yeah, call down fire from heaven type of a thing. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. That's just uh, that that's really kind of unsettled my soul after watching that movie a little bit. Somebody at the at the barn uh, with Daryl a couple weeks ago. Somebody talked about it and kind of got emotional talking about it a little bit, just recommending yeah. it. And this, I always like this one. That was kind of you can see the like. I don't know how to say it. Just the harshness of that life is yeah. put upon this little kid, and you can kind of see it. Yeah, it's like you can see a switchblade knife, kind of. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Just, I mean, he was he was probably he was probably six, five or six years old, and you can just already see kind of the deadness in his eyes. It was kind of you never know what they're facing, man. <clears throat> I was like that one. That was a kids' camp. Soccer. We did. Well, they so they did. We did a. A retreat for the kids in the villages. And <laughs> that does not look like he's been on a retreat. Well, and we had a, it wasn't an obstacle course, but it was like a rally race. You go through these different sections and you race through all of them and you got to do this. So he got to the end of it and just collapsed on the grass. And that was, he was making that face. And so I stood over him and got the picture. What a great it was, picture. thought it was really good. And this is Pablo. This is a dear friend of mine. Uh, that was him. Leading worship in his in his spot. He wasn't leading worship. He was off to the side on the piano. But he was he was always a really good worship leader. It was fun to to uh, the bokeh in these pictures is awesome. I I really liked uh, low apertures. So I've talked about Byron, one of the uh, one of the pastors down there. He yeah, was, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of him. Your this is this picture perfectly shows it's you. About to blow my mind, what Byron looks like. No, but it, it just perfectly shows you Byron's personality. So he he was he was a really really good friend and a and a very good pastor. He got me through some very very difficult times and just some wise counsel and that kind of thing. But we were having a relay race, uh, sack sack race, get the oh, sack yeah. and, and hop. And so uh, one of the guys was hopping along. Byron's in the on the left side. Just came, not even in the race, not doesn't have teams or anything, and just comes along and kicks the kid's feet out from underneath him. So I got him mid-kick. I don't even see his other leg. Byron's? Yeah. Well, he had, so he had kicked under his feet, and his, his leg's up here behind the behind the kid. And the kid's legs are in the sack, right? Yeah, and he's he's falling. It looks down. like he's wearing white pants, but he's actually in a <clears throat> white sack. Yeah, it's, I think it was a pillowcase. 
and uh, that's awesome. So Byron, the pastor, supportive pastor, uh, as a spectator in this sack race, says you're not winning, bro, <laughs> yeah, and just comes out and that's sweeps awesome. the legs. But I thought, how that, old was he? Who Byron? Uh huh. At that time, late thirties. No, he was. He's a few years older than I am. He was. Oh, okay. He was probably late twenties, early oh, okay. early thirties at that time. This is uh, Juan Carlos. I always thought this was a good picture of him talking on the phone. He just looked very. He there was a photo begging to happen there. Yeah, something, so, some important conversation is happening. I don't think so. I think he was just tired of the conversation. He was ready to hang up. He was just listening <laughs> at that point. <laughs> oh, past oh pastoral ministry, and uh, I think two. Yeah, two more. So this one, he was sleeping. He fell asleep in in somebody's hand. So you can see their hand kind of holding his head there. And he, is that kid in one of the other pictures? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Is he that? that First little girl, they look a lot alike. Mm. No, that's a little boy. It's not, yeah, the same, no. not the same person. Yeah, it's just like I was one of their brother and sister. But he fell asleep in somebody's hand. You can kind of see him holding their hand there and using their hand as a pillow. I always thought that was that's a good awesome. picture. And then last one, they were all playing with bubbles, and I caught her mid-jump. I thought that was a good one. That's cool. You can see her little feet and flip-flops off the ground. <laughs> Kids, man. So those are the top five photos that I ever took with this. <clears throat> That was 14, 14, 14, 14, 14 yeah. You get what I mean? So, yeah, <coughs> re retiring this thing, man, it was kind of, whenever I took this out of the camera bag and put that one in there, it was kind of sad whenever I took this one out. I was like, this thing. What are you going to do with it? I'll keep it. Put hat. it in like a shadow box or something? What's a shadow box? It's like a box that's kind of encased with like maybe plexiglass or whatever, and you kind of mm. put other little mementos in there with it. They'll probably sit on my bookshelf and collect dust for a while. And I it may. still works. Yeah, it still works great. I don't know. I may. You could sell it. No. What? No. <laughs> That's a dumb thing to say. Sorry. You get like 200 bucks for it, and it's, I would, I would, I'd, it would take a lot for me to sell that. Really? Like, I don't think I'd sell that for less than 5000 Oh, really? Just the nostalgia. Yeah. The, the sentimental value. Yeah, there's no sense in making 200 bucks. you know what I mean? Unless you're a drug dealer, or, I mean, addicted to drugs, and you needed it, I guess. Or yeah. If I ever get there, I'll, I'll have the camera, and I can sell it and give drugs. But If you ever get there... <laughs> If you ever get there, yeah, profane so. the name of God on Pondering <laughs> the Pages. Hey, y'all, welcome to Pondering the Pages with Pierce and Kyle. You said you had a song. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, what did you say You that made me say that? Something. <laughs> what did you say? I don't remember. Um, Danny T. No. Prophesying. Not even close. <laughs> 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 Brian T. Brian T. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what'd you say? You said something and it made me think of it. Bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, it was something about uh, prophecy. No, that I made the song was. Well, it has a line about it, but you said something completely unrelated and it made me think of a different line in that song that... I don't remember. I was looking for the song that you said, but I couldn't find it, so it's obviously not the title of the song. Mm -mm. No, I said a, I said one line from the song. Brian Trejo. Yeah. Brian T. He has he called Oh, it. you said the Shekinah Glory. Oh, that That's is. <laughs> uh, notice the blue light in the background, and a, a, the blue flame is sometimes representative of the Shekinah Glory in the Old Testament. As blue a flame. Would. Yeah, I think so. I thought it was a like a cloud. How'd you sleep last night? You sleep okay? Are you okay? I hate well, that's one of my least favorite questions in the world. I love asking you that. Are you okay? You alright? Because it, it it feels like the person's implying something's wrong with something's you. wrong with you. Yeah, what's wrong? It's a nicer way of asking what's wrong with you. It's like you look tired. Mm hmm. It's like thank you. Here we go. Here we go. So it's it's right. It's in the same. Same uh, breath as stop prophesying. Yeah, prophesying. That was the word I was saying. That you're prophesying. Half the time, you're only talking about some dollar signs, a cloud of glory, and a fog machine. Two different things stuck on tradition. You don't see God use new different things. So yeah, a cloud of glory and a fog machine. Two different things. Shekinah of glory. That's what that made me think of. That was I got a song for that. That's what that was. You know, Baptists. Do you know why Baptists never have outdoor baby dedications? No. 
Because if it starts raining, the babies become Presbyterian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's pretty good. I got a question for you. I may not be able to answer it. So this one's going to take some attention, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait till you're finished. I'm just looking for if there's anything. Yeah, what are you looking for? This kind of glory being blue. A blue cloud is what I always... A blue cloud? That's what I always thought. I don't know. It's Honestly, it's kind of a... I know it's not a salvific issue, but I don't need to keep saying that if it's not in the Bible, right? Yeah. So, you ready for this question? I'm ready. Would you rather only have the... This is the game that Jackson and Eve would play with me all the time. <laughs> would you rather... <laughs> So I, I feel like this is a good one. This is I was thinking about this the other day, and okay. it made me uh, ask myself this question. Would you rather only have the memories that you currently have, and you're not able to store any more memories? So you, you could still function. If I said, hey, call me tomorrow, you'd still remember to call me tomorrow. But as far as memories that you think back on as good times or, or whatever, just memories, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So you only have the memories that you have up to this moment, and from now on you can you make no more memories. You just you still have memory to function though, or you lose all of the memories that you have up to this moment, and the only memories that you have going forward are ones that you make from this moment going forward. Would I be justified? Not even a part of the question. Yes. Well, yeah. If I'm justified, I would just take the memories going forward. Why? Because I would have the Holy Spirit inside of me and the love would still be there for people and I would just continue to create new memories with the people I already love. Talk about it a little bit more. Well, it's just like most of the time you love the people that you love based on the memories that you have about them or you have disdain for a particular person because of the memories that you have about them. So if I'm justified, if I'm walking in a state of justification then I've entered into sanctification if justified. So I think that I would, in a sense, be starting fresh with the Word of God without any of the soul conditioning that happened prior to my justification. No, you don't, you don't have any, you don't have amnesia or anything like that. You don't, you don't like lose. I don't lose my memories? You lose, you lose the memories as far as. Up until that point. Yeah, but not like all knowledge of your past. Just like whenever you think back on certain moments in life, certain memories that you have, that baseball game you went to or or things like that. But you don't like you don't forget where you grew up and, and like basic knowledge. You just lose the the mental photo album, so to speak. Mm. That's a so putting it in pictures like that yeah, makes it's not, it a little bit not, different. Not fifty first dates where you just com- are completely clueless about Okay. But you, you lose the the special moments that you think back on, the memories that you've made. Uh, Just the good ones or bad ones too? All memories. Yeah, I'd, I'd take it not, going. Not functional memories. Let me say it that way. Not functional, just nostalgic. Uh, the mental photo album. It's mental home videos. So would you basically think of think of your photo albums and home videos. Yeah. You lose all of your mental ones from the past, and and only you only have the ones that you make from now on, or you keep the ones that you have from the past, and you don't make any more. You only you only have the mental photo albums and home videos that you. Yeah, I think I'd, I th- I think I would, from this moment forward. Really? Yeah, just because I mean I think that we would be remiss if we said that we weren't sinners, and it's just like I've committed a lot of sins that you know are mental pictures in my brain that I mm. I did and if I'm gonna be able to lose those, yeah, I would I would lose those. Mm. I mean it's just like all the pornographic images I've ever seen, it's just yeah. like I'd those would be gone. I'm yeah. out. So it's just like I think it'd be kind of a not a fresh start per se, but at the same time it's just like I'm better at sanctification now than I was then. Mm-hmm. And it's just like so I think that based on just the knowledge of the word and walking with Jesus for a longer period of time, I still sin. Right. I still miss the mark on a daily, but at the same time I'm better than I used to be. Mm-hmm. So I think that, and if I'm still in relationship with all the people that I love, mm-hmm. I mean, I'll just make new ones Yeah, and they'll probably be better. Vody bacham has got a good, good line in one of his <laughs> sermons where he says, uh, I'm not who I ought to be, but hallelujah, I'm not who I was. Yeah. It's in the rescuer. 
the sermon, not the movie. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Sammy Kershaw has a good song about that. How's it go? What's it say? I'm better than I used to be. Mm. Um, it just he's uh, he just goes on to talking about you know he's he's beat a lot of demons to the ground, but he's got a still got a few he's got a lick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting. I am. What are you What are you doing over there? You know what I'm doing. Are you still looking for the Shekinah? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that word's in scripture one time. Blue flame. Oh, the Shekinah is in there. I don't. I don't think blue flame is in there. I. Th- I mean. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's flame. I don't, Shekinah has nothing to do with flame. That, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. We're pondering the pages. What do you uh, turn your screen around? Let me see what you're on. I'm just. Is that blue letter Bible? No, I'm just reading through just different scriptures and then just trying to check them in the Bible. Uh, Genesis 22. This is I'm 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 leaving you behind. I'm leaving. Kinda, I'm leaving the blue flame. You gotta let it go. There's no there is no blue flame. You, I don't know where you got that from. Genesis 22, starting in verse one. So we talked a couple episodes back about um, test. You like to say versus that, tempt. You're right. You you like to say that God tests no one. I like, or like, I've heard you say that a couple yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'll stop saying that. Like, I'm going to stop saying blue flame if I can't find so, it. So, uh, God tempts no one. We we saw that. We looked at that in, where's that? Colossians? Colossians 3? Do not. It's in James, isn't it? James. That's what it is. James 1. So, Genesis, I got I got two, uh, two verses for you here. <laughs> Genesis 22. So, I got two verses for you here. Uh, Genesis 22 is the first one. Now Definitely it, a test. Now it came now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. There so we I, go. I don't need to read any farther, but oh. I, could, I could. I, sh- I will. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So God absolutely tested Abraham. So the one thing that I do see about tests... Mm-hmm is tests, as far as I see so far, are really about obedience. It's just about obedience. And I'd agree. And I don't think that there are tests, and I think that, that when you look at James, it's tempting with evil. God will never tempt you with evil. Right. Yeah. It's, well, I think that I would I would assume, I didn't go this far into it, but I would assume there are different words, too. Test and tempt, and in, in the original Hebrew versus Greek, or yeah, if you, I mean, if you translated both into Greek, if you use the uh, Septuagint, I, yeah. I would assume they'd both be different words. That'd be in, go to. Uh, I'll let you read this one. Go to uh, Psalm eleven verses four through five. Let me pull it up in the blue letter so I can. Well, I was I was gonna look at the find the Septuagint and look at both of them while you read this one. Psalm. He's going rogue. Psalm 11, verses 4 through 5. Are you looking up the original language? Or no. You, okay. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord, his throne is in heaven. His eyes watch. His gaze examines everyone. The Lord examines the righteous, but he hates the wicked and those who love violence. What what uh, version are you reading there? That's Christian standard. You know better than that, Kyle. Come on. You don't like the Christian standard? The Lord in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold the eyelids, test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. So there's two. Yep, tests. Test, test, baby. There's a G here. Let me see what G is. I like I like studying the Bible. There's a what there? Oh, a... Superscript, superscript, subscript. So see superscript. Job twenty three ten. So funny. You think you know the Bible and then you turn the wrong way. <laughs> Which way did you just? I went the wrong way from Psalm to Job. Mm-hmm. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That'd be test tried. Yeah, it's a purification process. Mm-hmm. He's looking for obedience. 
Yeah. And obedience is the purification, I think. Don't you think? If you're obedient, I think you it, become more holy. I think it goes goes along with um, um, count it all joy when you when you experience trials because um, I'm going to misquote. I think I'm combining two verses here, but trials produce steadfastness, and steadfastness produces integrity. In, interesting. In verse five, the Lord tests the righteous. When you go to G, which is what it says. Genesis twenty two one is the first scripture. It, and then James one twelve. Oh yeah. And then Psalm five five. Ooh, what's that one? I, I don't know. <laughs> Psalm five five. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Hmm. You are in the NASB. Correct. I yeah. am in the ESV. Yes. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Hmm. So that's a... Does God... This So um, how do I want to ask this question? Evildoers are not justified. Well, does... <laughs> when you tell somebody who... Um, Let's say you're evangelizing to somebody who's just who outright rejects God, just wholeheartedly rejects God uh, and makes no bones about it. Are you correct in telling them, like God loves you? Look, you know, and trying to basically trying to. Uh, um, Are you casting your pearls before swine? Well, yeah, that that's. <laughs> Are you correct in saying that God loves you, telling that person that God loves them? I would say, yeah. Ba but based on that scripture, I don't really hold a view yet on this one. I'm still figuring it out. But based on that one, God hates the wicked. Uh, well, I think it goes back to that creation versus children thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, I think he loves his creation. But... I don't know. I'll show you my faith by my works, and I think that you can't get good fruit off a bad tree. You can't get bad fruit off a good tree. Um, it's almost like the evildoer thing. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, definitely, that's a... How does faith by works come into that? As I think far it's the, as the fruit. It, I mean, if they're an evildoer, that's obviously bad fruit, I would think. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be on a good tree. And I think well, just regardless of... They're not, they're not saved, and they're wicked. Mm -hmm. That verse says that God hates the wicked. So are you correct, or are you, are you accurate or inaccurate telling somebody who's wicked? God loves you. Just accept him. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I guess, I mean, now that you kind of phrase it that way, I was probably too uh, quick to answer that a while ago. It's just like, I, I think he does love them because mm -hmm. I think he loves his creation, but they're not his children. Yeah. And it's just like it's a, it's a, almost a, a different kind of love. So try to, I'm putting you on the spot here, but try to, try to make that mesh fit with God hates the wicked it's like he loves them it's a different kind of love you know as a as creation not children but he also hates them at the same time try to as a tough one I'm just kind of throwing you under the bus a little bit but yeah no you're good I think that that's what that's what we do that is verse five I just want to go to the Hebrew word and I want to see what hate looks like there so we're Psalm 5 5 ah, I went to Proverbs <laughs> I don't want to go to Proverbs. I want to go to Psalm 5.5. Five. You hate all evildoers. I mean, and that, that one doesn't say evil evildoers. It's the person. Thou hatest. To hate, be hateful. To hate of man, of God, hater. One hating enemy. To be hated, hater. Yeah, it pretty much means hate.
you hated me and sent me away from you. Um, I think that they're, I mean, obviously we're in the Old Testament in Psalms. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that his wrath is still upon them. And only through what Christ did did his wrath get put on Jesus and off of us. So I think prior to Jesus, I mean, I think he hated them. Right, but uh, in this in this scenario, this person is outside of Christ. This person's not in Christ, so they're they're still the propitiation, the mm-hmm. satisfaction of God's wrath has not been applied for this person yet. So does he? He's he's in a, he's in I would say he's in the same position as an Old Testament believer who, of course, the Old Testament saints were still they were in Christ, just just not the fulfillment credit, yet. not debit, you know. It's interesting to think about. I mean, I think that, yeah, I think that if his wrath is on you, then I think he hates you. Mm -hmm. Um, You're basically lumped into this group that's going to suffer his wrath. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. And I think that when you've been given the gift of faith, now some of these Old Testament saints had been given the gift of faith to believe that a Messiah was coming. And I think that we have to almost kind of go to I don't know what else to do other than go to the Bible that that will just use the the loose word hell was divided into two sides. You had Abraham's bosom and you had the torment side. Mm -hmm. And there was a great chasm that separated them if we go to Luke 16. And I think Jesus is giving you a little bit of a snapshot. But those that were given the gift of faith to believe that a Messiah was coming, when Jesus was put in the grave, it says he descended. Now, a lot of people believe that he went down and preached to the Old Testament saints, basically giving them revelation that the Messiah has come and basically no longer a credit. But now, now it's paid. The now it's credit, paid. Credit's been paid to Telestai. It is finished. What was the verse in. Sorry, I'm. Doing background research. What was the verse in James? Um, one twelve. Okay, I think. Continue. So I think that that's kind of just the proof positive that if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then he was not deity. You know, so right. I think that it basically it kind of says if there is no resurrection then Jesus himself is not raised from the dead and our our faith is is in vain futile it's mm-hmm. uh, in vain we're to be pitied over all because we're basically walking around like zombies believing something that's not true where are you going i was looking at, i went to the septuagint to see if which is the greek translation of the old testament to see if the genesis 22 and james 1 if they're different words tempt and test and in fact they are different words so they're both (coughs) both greek now we're not doing hebrew and greek both greek now what's the words nasa in genesis genesis 22 which is uh test god tested abraham and then i'm not sure how to pronounce this one this is in James one thirteen. G thirty nine eighty five, Pirazzo, Pirazzo. That one is tempt. I knew how to pronounce that. Did you? Go ahead and pronounce it. <laughs> Pirazzo, Pirazzo. <laughs> so that one is uh, tempt. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. So, so they are in fact different words. Um, tempt and test. I even wrote wrote a little bit of Hebrew there, Greek. I mean, oh, oh. Try yeah, I think. I think that when there's a test, Mm -hmm. it's almost you know what to do. Mm -hmm. When there's a test, you know what to do based on the Word of God. And I don't think that he, he, I do not think that God tests people who are not justified. He does not test people who don't have the gift of faith. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. I don't know if he does, but I don't think it's outside, he could. There's, yeah. there's nothing that indicates that he couldn't or wouldn't. No, I mean, all things are possible with God. Mm-hmm. But it looks like 
obedience is a father to a son or a father to a daughter. And if they're not children of God, then it's not a father-son, father-daughter relationship. But there is obedience as far as king and citizen of the kingdom or or uh, authority, owner authority of earth and living on earth, a non-believer living on earth. God's, God's an authority over everybody, regardless of whether they're a child of his or not. So there is uh, father-daughter or father-son. Uh-huh. Obedience is, is one scenario, but it's not the only scenario. Yeah. Uh, as far uh, as the testing? As far as just how things exist. So it's it, it wouldn't be outside of God's uh, character if he decided to test a non-believer for whatever purpose. Yeah. Like, um, I'm trying to think, would you call Judas, Judas' situation, would you call that a test that he failed? No, I would think it would be a prophetic fulfillment. Well, it could have that. There could have been a a test happening within that. Yeah. I don't think they're mutually ex- mutually exclusive. Could have been a. a uh, no, I think that there was an appointed time for Judas to come on the scene. Well, I think uh, I think it could have. Well, I'm saying it could have happened within that. Yeah. Like, uh, just because it was prophesied doesn't mean that God can't do this test at the same time. Um. But I think it. I think that would fall more under the category of temptation. Do you think, as far as Judas's situation? I don't in the temptation because God will not tempt you with evil. Well, I don't not, think that Judas was ever justified. I think we're going in two different directions here. Maybe so. Uh, not talking about justification at all. That's not a part of the conversation. Judas's situation. Is it possible that it could have been a test or? a a test by God. Um, I'm saying I think it was not so much a test. It was more of a temptation, just putting myself in Judas's shoes. Mm. He's, he's, he's greedy. He likes money and he's offered money to betray Jesus. So I'd say that it was a, it was a temptation, but not, not by God. No, not by God. I'm just saying it was a temptation. I just don't know if it was a test. Well, I don't, I don't between the two. I think it was more a temptation than a test. It's yeah, definitely. Just, the temptation come to the evil one, I think. Yeah, but as far as what is Judas's experience, is he being tested or is this a temptation for him? Is he going going through a test or is he being tempted? I was saying, I think it was more of a temptation. Um, yeah, because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I think that he was tempted by the evil one to trade Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's where his heart was was with money, and so that's why I think that's yeah. why it would, it would probably be more of a temptation than a than a test. Just the nature of the situation, not necessarily who's doing it or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's the differentiating thing. God tempts no one, especially with evil, and I think that the evil one, Lucifer, Satan, Beelzebub, well, he even entered into to Judas, right? Yeah, Satan did. So he gave himself over to him in a mm-hmm. sense. By succumbing to the temptation, mm-hmm. I think by succumbing to the temptation, he made himself available for Satan to use him as a pawn. Open the door, open a foothold, or gave the devil a foothold. Yeah, as far as I'm not sure, I can't think of an example, and they're probably in there. I can't think of an example where, well, Saul, King Saul. Yeah, so King Saul. I mean. Definitely, it seems as if there was a test being given when he was waiting on Samuel to mm-hmm. come and make sacrifice, and he failed the test. Yeah, he failed the test, mm-hmm. and that was real. Uh, that was when the kingdom was ripped from him when he failed that test. Yeah, that's true, and that the lineage changed at that point. As far as the bloodline, bloodline changed. Yeah, it's just like. I mean, David had already been anointed. Yeah, because uh, see, that's that's kind of the sovereignty of God because mm-hmm. Jesus was not in Saul's bloodline, right? David was also not in Saul's bloodline, but Jesus is a part of David's bloodline. So God, God is going to make David king. There's nobody can stop that from happening. That's right. But it he still presented if if we. Uh, we can assume that this is the way it went. He still presented Saul with that test, yeah, knowing that Saul would fail, and then he would he would put the the uh, lineage of the king in in David's bloodline. 
and so then Jesus would come later through that. So it's <clears throat> it's a picture of God's sovereignty and man's free will not butting heads, not uh, contradict or or not. Uh, what am I trying to say here? They can work together. They can work at the same time. God is sovereign over everything. He had he he wanted to get the bloodline, the the king king lineage of the king from Saul to David, so that Jesus would be a part of the the king's bloodline. Mm-hmm. But he didn't just remove Saul without. Uh, he didn't just kill him and then decide to make David king. Saul kind of dug his own grave, so to speak. It was always going to be David, though. Right, but the point I'm making is is we're we're not robots. God didn't just kill Saul one day. Everything was going great with Saul. He was a great king, and then God just killed him because he needed to make David <laughs> the, the king Yeah, for the sake of the bloodline. Saul hung himself, and not fig- yeah, yeah. figuratively. Yeah, and yeah. and um, so, the, so God's sovereignty, God didn't override Saul's... Uh, Free will. Yeah, I don't like that word, but, but his... Uh, ability to to make decisions and uh but he so he's still Saul's free will and and capacity to hang himself which he did and God's sovereignty were working at the same time it was not just God just killed Saul while everything was going great so that he could get David in there it the God's you get what I'm trying to say yeah I think so for some reason, in my brain, it keeps popping up, and it's just like, I don't know why, so it's just like, hmm. I'm going to try to butcher this as much as I can. Go for it. So I think there's a difference between what they call kairos moments and chronos moments, and a kairos moment is, this is an appointed, this is an appointed time. Mm-hmm. This is when this is supposed to happen. And then there's chronos moments, which are just happening along the timeline. But I think that the appointed time, so basically... That was a Kairos moment. It's just like this test. But, but tell me the difference between the two. A Kairos moment is like, okay, this is an this is an appointed time. This is like, this is happening. So, and then you got a Chronos moment, which is just basically if you take ecclesiology and you just take the entire timeline. This is supposed to happen here. This is supposed to happen here. Mm-hmm. This is supposed to happen here. But I think that when there's a test that's happening on that timeline, then I think that you can either pass or fail that test. And those are, are Kairos moments. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was always supposed to be David. It -hmm. was always supposed to be David. It was the people that rejected God that made Saul king. And God gave them what they wanted because Samuel even said, you know, they rejected me as the priest, and God said, no, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me because they wanted what other civilizations had. They wanted a king. They wanted to be powerful. So that's when, you know, Saul's hiding over here, and and they find him, and he becomes king. But it was always supposed to be. I think that that was a Kairos moment when the people of Israel selected Saul to be king. They wanted a king so bad, God gave it to them. Mm-hmm. And he said, you don't know what you're doing to yourself, but I'm going to give it to you. You know, your your sons are going to be killed in war and all these other things. There's going to be horrible things happen because of this. But because of Genesis 3, the seed of woman, not the seed of man, the seed of woman, it was always going to be David. It was right. always going to be David because we know that Joseph is not Jesus' earthly father. Mm-hmm. We know that there was no semen that came out of Joseph into Mary that made Jesus. Yep, we got that. <laughs> so it was always going to be Mary, the seed of woman, that was in the lineage of David. Mm-hmm. So that was just a that was a Kronos moment. That was a that was a Kronos on the timeline. And this is basically an appointed time that, okay, all the cards line up, here it is. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the same thing with Judas. I think that it was just, this is when this is supposed to happen. Jesus has already come on the stage and presented himself as the one. So now everything that happens was supposed to happen. I mean, three years in ministry, 30 pieces of silver, everything worked out perfect according to God's sovereignty. Pontius Pilate is 
basically over this countryside everywhere that's at that time. Uh, Ananias, or basically Annas, um, was the high priest. Anus? <laughs> Did you go anus with me just right then? It's just like you're... it reminded me of a story. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> what was the story? Um, it was a potluck. It, this is probably over a year ago at this point, <laughs> but we were at a potluck and somebody brought some cookies. They looked like chocolate chip cookies, but I I couldn't quite figure. It weren't wasn't chocolate chip. They were I anise. Couldn't quite figure out what the what they were, <laughs> and. Uh, I was sitting with Grandma, and I tore off a piece of the cookie. I said, Grandma, try this and see if you can tell me what it is. I can't figure It's not chocolate chip. She tried it. She's sitting there chewing on it. She goes, that tastes like black anise. And I I can't remember who was at the table <laughs> with me, but but we started laughing. I said, what's it taste like? And she said, anise, black anise. Black anise. And she eventually I learned that that's the plant that they use to make licorice. It's licorice. Yeah, it's, uh, we so got these know. spice drops one time. <laughs> Me and Jackson and Eva, we just wanted to try these spice drops. They're like the little jelly candies. Mm -hmm. They're all different flavors. So you had licorice, spearmint, wintergreen. Anise was one of them. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I guess if you had never really had candy and that was like the first candy, you'd be like, this is awesome. But compared to some of the candies we have today, the different flavors, blue raspberry and, you know. Green apple. All those different things. It's just like, those suck. Yeah. But eh, whatever. I've never really liked licorice. It's never been my thing. I like, dude. There's a licorice that you would have to try before you judge it too harshly. Paul Newman makes a licorice. It's a strawberry licorice, mm -hmm. and I like licorice that is hard. I do not like mushy licorice. Like uh, Twizzlers. Twizzlers is mushy. Okay. Okay. So I like it hard. I like it chewy. I'm. A, I when it comes to licorice, I'm a texture guy. Okay. <laughs> so and I like a little bit of that strawberry flavor, and he's got a a little bit of tartness in his. There's a there's a song called Paul Newman, by. <laughs> new man like Paul no new man. Shout them out like who then? Not on the playlist. Not on the. It's on my. It's a liked song on Spotify, but it's not definitely not on the playlist. So. An interesting topic. Jackson has been kind of. You know, I think that he's just, I believe he has just recently justified, so he's starting to have some questions. Mm -hmm. And the judgment seat of Christ came up, and he was talking about second chances. And he was asking the question, and me and April were discussing it last night after the kids had went to bed, and it's just like we need to have a conversation with him, sit down with an open Bible, and just kind of talk about second chances. And what the second chance was, if you're left behind, you know, the Left Behind series. And this is really going to fold into like a pre-tribulation rapture is where these beliefs are going to come from. So a pre-tribulation rapture would basically be that Christians are going to be, are not going to be subjected to the mark of the beast, uh, the trials and tribulations that come during the Great Tribulation. And he was basically saying, he was basically asking the question, if you don't accept Jesus and the rapture happens, will you be given a second chance? So. Well, that yeah, that assumes the. Do you uh, agree with the left behind theology? The theology of the left behind series? I'm not a pre-tribber, so that would answer that question. So what was your answer? I would that's that would be my answer. It's like, well, we I don't believe that I haven't had the conversation with him yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that would be my answer. Well, if it's a it's a null it's null and void because it Left Behind series is based on pre trib. <laughs> right. So it it oh, there's a Shylin song where he talks about it. I was gonna look for it, but he um Yeah, if if that scenario won't exist, I believe it won't ever exist. So I don't, uh, but, so he's asking a question about something that won't happen. So in, instead of my answer to him would be, I don't know if you asked me this or not, but instead of trying to come up with an answer for that scenario, I would just say that scenario won't exist. So you don't need an answer that it won't happen. Yeah. I think that 
the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. It talks about tribulation saints that are beheaded under the altar. Mm -hmm. Right? That they're just waiting and they're crying out, when will you avenge us? And basically another one of those chronos moments, you have to wait for the appointed time. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for me to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture if there are beheaded saints. Well, there's saints that are beheaded right now. We're not in the we're not in the tribulation, but there are saints yeah. that have been beheaded. Yeah, so I think that they're they're referenced as the the tribulation saints mm. in scripture, or is that the name that has been given to them after? That's a great question. I think that we would have to ponder the pages to kind of see exactly where that's at. Can you find that? Um, it's in Revelation. But anyways, mm -hmm. I lean more toward a mid or post trib rapture or harpezo, which the word is. The word rapture doesn't occur in scripture. Keep going. Okay. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, the tribulation is a seven year period of time, and you have the lesser and the greater tribulation during those times. So, the demarcation that begins the tribulation would be the setting up of the Antichrist and also the return of animal sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem by the Jews. There's a peace treaty that's made by the Antichrist and the Jews that they are able to start animal sacrifice again. And then that lasts for three and a half years. I think during that three and a half years, persecution is off of the Jewish people, and it's more on to the Christians. And then at the demarcation of three and a half years, the Antichrist breaks the peace treaty with the Jews, and he starts to thwart all of his intents and purposes toward the Jews. And this is where it says that they flee to Jordan or maybe what city they refer to as Petra. And then the last three and a half years is the persecution of the Jews. So if you're mid-trib, then at that three and a half year mark, the saints, believers, the church is raptured out. But it's through supernatural provision that it's like basically the Jewish people have to be brought to their very the end of themselves yeah. and they cry out for the Messiah and basically start to realize that Jesus was the Messiah and he rescues them right before they're about to be annihilated in Petra at the end of the great tribulation at the end of seven years. That's Armageddon, right? So that'd Is be that Armageddon. Different? There's about nine wars that you kind of look okay. at in end times, but yeah, I would say that would be Armageddon. And then the, then the millennial reign of Christ begins. I'm trying to find, where that is in in Revelation, I can't find the beheading it. of the saints. Yeah, they're the beheaded saints. It's I, whenever I searched the tribulation saints, Revelation, everything is coming up chapter seven, Revelation chapter seven, but that's not that's not it. I think I think referring to them as the tribulation saints is not in scripture. I think that's a that's a human addition later on, which is interesting because the Revelation six nine through eleven. Because these these little subtitles that you have in your Bible and everything, they they weren't there. Well, they they uh, are influenced by certain views, certain sure. doctrinal views. Uh, so six, did you say one through nine or nine? Nine, verse nine. nine through <clears throat> eleven. Uh, and I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So that and they could cried, be now, then, and they cried out with a loud voice, uh, "How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth?" And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were killed, even as they had been, would be completed. Also, until the number of their fellow servants and the brethren. So that sounds like. That sounds like a, a culmination of all. Yeah, that that sounds like in, until the very last one of God's elect is brought into the family. The only the only reason that 
I could go either way mm -hmm. is because of the timeline of the seals. Okay. So you got to go through the seals. So you're on the seventh seal. Uh, fifth. So, I mean, but at the same time, you're in the seven, the seven seals. Yeah. That's the fifth seal. Yeah. So you've already had one, two, three, four, five, which should give you some demarcation of ecclesiology. Okay. So the first seal, rider on the white horse. Yep. Uh, Has that happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just like, so you have to look at the, the basically the, the chronos, or you have to look at the chronology of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that based on that, this looks to be happening during the Great Tribulation. That's why I think they're the, referencing the Great Tribulation or the seven, the whole thing, all seven years. So that would be, I guess, the tribulation, the Great Tribulation. Then you have the Lesser and the Greater Tribulation. Mm -hmm. So the Great Tribulation is the what do they call that? The uh, it's something the sorrow of Jacob, or it's the seven years is is known as that. But a lot of people say the last three and a half years is the greater tribulation of the tribulation. So you have seven years, the first three and a half years, lesser tribulation, the other three and a half years, the greater tribulation. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people want to use this replacement theology. A lot of times it is talking about it is talking about Israel when you're referencing these things. So when you're talking about the lesser tribulation versus the greater tribulation, I think the greater tribulation is referencing the persecution of God's chosen people, Israel. Israel. Mm. And replacement theology would say, no, that's talking about the church. Well, you got to take it in context. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you got to take it in context. It's very hard to understand Revelation without understanding the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Daniel was a Jew. Everything has basically come through the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. The Bible has come through Jews. Yeah. Uh, so I think that we have to we have to go back to context there. Um, so that would be just the timeline. Revelations is a great study. I think that it's it's hard. It's uh, just because there there are so many different uh, opinions. Yeah, and it's it's. That's the case with a lot of scripture, but it seems for in my experience, Revelation is particularly difficult to understand, to maintain an understanding of the different opinions at one time so that I can examine them and pick one. Does that make sense? It's like if if you if I give you three different water bottles and I tell you pick one based on the way you, you which one you'd like which which one looks best to you, mm -hmm. just on looks, you have them in front of you and you can look at them and examine them. Trying to hold an understanding of the different opinions of Revelation in my brain so that I can look at them and examine them long enough to form an opinion yeah. is very difficult to do. And so I, it's just, it's, uh, you struggling over there with the ribbon? <laughs> it's hard to get... <laughs> You could have just gone from the bottom, or was, was it folded? It was deceiving me. I was like, there, "There's three ribbons." <laughs> oh, that's funny. But yeah, it's so so. Revel <clears throat> man, Revelation's a difficult one. Um, I can't remember. Oh, it was in that an evening of eschatology that that uh, debate. Uh, I believe it was Sam Storms, one of the guys. Maybe it was Piper said. It's important to have a view on eschatology. Maybe I got, I got this from somebody else probably. But they, they said it's it's really tempting, and I've definitely been guilty of this. It's really tempting to just like throw your hands up and say, I don't know, I can't understand this enough. Yeah. But it's, they, they I can't remember what they said, but they made a really, really convincing argument for you should try to understand it and come to an opinion because it affects different different parts of your theology and different doctrines that you hold. Um, I think the very beginning of it kind of is almost, I mean, it's, I mean, you read in verse one, chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. That kind of sounds important. 
Yeah. I mean, blessed are the ones who read the words aloud and blessed are the ones who hear and keep what's written in it. Yeah, you got to understand it to keep it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to play by the rules if you don't know the rules. Mm -hmm. It's difficult though. I like it. I don't think it's I think it is for everybody to to read. I mean, I, obviously we have teachers and different things that they have certain equippings that can help you to unpack it. I think commentaries and commentators have have helped me, but at the same time I say helped me supplementary but there is no there is no substitute for actually reading the word of god yourself and praying god give you revelation over what's in his written word mm -hmm. and based on the gift of the holy spirit that lives within us at justification he's able oh yeah you got just got to give him give him the opportunity mm -hmm. you know and i think that bring him into your study Bring him into your study. Ask him to be there with you when you're studying. It's just like he's a teacher. I mean, it, it refers to him as a teacher. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't understand this. And pray, you know, if you don't have understanding. I think that what I've done a lot of times is I don't understand a thing, and I just keep reading. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I that sometimes there's that's just moment for pause. God, help me to understand this. Yeah. I think I just need to read it more times too. The the more times you've read it, the the more it's ingrained in yeah. in your brain, and it, you can kind of hold on to it and examine it, like I was talking about. For sure, I started reading a, a book called uh, "Living Life Backwards." It's a book. It's basically a commentary on uh, Ecclesiastes, and it so basically live life backwards. You live your life based on the knowledge that you will die someday, based on knowing that you're going to die. Talk, you think about your death. And uh, living your life, and it's I've only gotten like a chapter and a half in so far, but it's it's uh, I really like it because it, I've I've looked for commentaries on Ecclesiastes, I've looked for different things like that. There's not a lot of not at least the the teachers that I trust where I can I I'm pretty comfortable just taking their opinion yeah. pretty you know for for quite a ways. Um, none of them have unpacked it for you. Yeah, and like I've even looked for like uh. John Calvin, Thomas Watson, Jonathan Edwards. I've looked for for all John Bunyan. I've looked for there all the Johns commentaries, and not I just haven't found any good commentaries on uh, there. Not a lot that exist on Ecclesiastes. So this book has been really. Uh, I'm really excited to to read it. Um, I thought about sharing it with Greg whenever I finish it, but it's kind of one of those things where I'm I'm excited about it, and I feel like he would just be like, ah, I just don't get it. Whatever, and I just it's you like, never know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could just send it to him as a gift anonymously. Yeah, I could do that. That'd be good. But yeah, if his if his uh, reaction to it was anything like it was in the study <laughs> and Tuesday mornings men's thing, man, it was just that was that was frustrating. That was a tough one. That was kind of a disappointment, so to speak. Just the the like eagerness to not read it. It's like, ah, oh, let's just get done with this. Let's do something else. It's kind of like what you're saying. It's like, well, just don't just keep reading or don't just move on. Like, let's try to let's try to figure it out. You know, let's. I've gotten so wrapped up in that in the past. It's just like, just trying to get through it so I can get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, just keep going, just keep trudging on, and I'm starting to become more patient. That I don't think I have to be patient with the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to teach me patience by taking the opportunity just to just just wait. Mm. Just wait. He says, what does he say? He says, those who wait on the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, and I think that sometimes we just get so wrapped up in, in I got to get this done, I got to get this done, and I'm horrible about it. So I just got a text from my wife. It says you need to come. No. So we got this cow that we thought she wasn't pregnant, but I guess she was. She just had a calf. Like just now? Yeah, I guess this morning. My kids will be absolutely smitten with this cow. 
I hope it's a I hope it's a female cow. Different color than the mama. The bull's black. Oh. <laughs> that was a sn- <laughs> we had a snort there, boy. Wait. Um <clears throat> For you, I wait. I wait for your word. Who wait for? There it is. Who wait for the Lord? Isaiah forty. Is that where it's at? Isaiah forty thirty one. I need to go back and read some of the major prophets. It's been a while since I've since I've read any of those. Those who wait upon the Lord. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Again, back to Saul. Mm-hmm. If he would just waited on the Lord, he would have passed that test. Yeah. Well, again, that kind of goes, that had to happen, the sovereignty of God, but it's just like Romans 1. That had to happen. There was always the possibility, <laughs> technically speaking, that Saul could have passed that test. And potentially kept the throne. But God's sovereignty, David was going to end up in the throne. But that's not to say that Saul didn't have the option. It's like um, Romans 1. They know that God exists. They they got his place to turn. That's not Romans 1. God's place to turn in our hearts. But um, uh, the the invisible attributes God's see his a, creation God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the beginning they know that God exists but they because of their unrighteousness they suppress the truth therefore they're without excuse so that God's election and and sovereign choice and salvation of 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 some does not negate responsibility on those who are not saved it does not uh, nullify and and cause them to be innocent it, they're still they still still hold responsibility there are without excuse god's sovereignty and man's free will can work at the same time this has always been a little bit of a a scripture that i think causes division maybe i'm i don't uh no, go ahead i'll, I'll tell you that. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Mm-hmm. That Those letters are in red, so it's like you don't have to say, well, it's... That's Jesus talking. Mm-hmm. It's just like, not everybody's going to be saved. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what that's saying. <clears throat> not everybody is going to... In fact, a majority won't be saved. Yeah, it's a few. Mm-hmm. I mean, many, the majority will go the wide way. Few will go the narrow way. I hope there's oh. some video what this guy's doing. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was releasing pressure in my, my right ear. By farting? I was holding my nose and blowing... And then right after that, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And then he goes on to say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I just... So read the last two. Last two verses? Yeah, that you just read. And I'm going to... On gonna, that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Okay, go back one more. It, where those who do the will of my Father 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then I'll supplement that with this. And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent, or the will of God. 629. Yeah. I didn't know I had to Google it, and that's what took me so long, and so I had to. But, uh, yeah, so the... I feel like some people would, those who do the will of my father, it's like, oh man, well, how do I know God's will? And I think it's, I think that's the will of the father, at least in that um, context. Yeah. Believe in the one whom he sent. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's true saving faith in Christ that only comes as a free gift from the father. Mm -hmm. And I think that if that exists in you, you will, you will get in the word of God, mm-hmm. which is the revealed will of God, yeah. and you will try your best to obedient, be obedient to it. Mm-hmm. Will there be tests of your obedience to the word? Absolutely. Yes. But there will not be temptations for you to do evil that come from God. Right. They will be there, but they, it, they're not they, from God. They don't, they're not from God. Yeah. yeah. So all you got to do is just ask Jesus into your heart when you're six, and then you're good to go. Do whatever you want for the get rest of your life. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> well... Thanks for pondering the pages with us. And if you're watching, thanks for having patience with the cameras. We're still getting those. Mine, mine was going in and out of focus. I think it was trying to, your Bible. That's why I moved your water bottle because it was, kept focusing on your water bottle over oh, here. Oh, yeah. It's just like, wanted to focus on the word, not the water. It, kept, it, it was wanting to focus on, on your Bible there too. But anyway. Well, we'll see you next time. See you then. <laughs>